Right, I'm delighted to say Daniel Story is with us to talk to us about the situation at Manchester United specifically at the moment. Uh, Daniel, we, we are surrounded in this studio by Manchester United fans and they're very happy with life at the moment. They're feeling like there's a bit of a throwback era going on. Basically, their belief, their contention is that they're back. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly this happens. I think for most of last season and probably the season before that, I was kind of writing and arguing that super clubs like Manchester United don't need these kind of massive overhauls. They don't necessarily even need new owners, although I think we can all agree that would be a good thing. What they need is uh, some old-fashioned competence and the bit between their teeth and probably the kind of finishing line in sight, however far away it is, that gives everyone a belief that they're moving in the right direction. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing it quicker than I imagined, I think quicker than probably everyone in that studio imagined. But uh, when you get a, a massively successful, historically successful, rich club with good players and give them a, an able coach, it's it's amazing how quickly everything can look like it's fallen into place. I, I think um, it, it's difficult to... It's easy to overstate nights like last night and also a League Cup, but also in the wider context of everything that's gone before, it's also really important that they have a trophy early on that they can pin their hopes to and, and kind of go, OK, that, that's what the level of expectation should be. We saw the price of the tickets and obviously Newcastle were, were feeding into that as well. But the the slight hangover they had in the first half, being able to think their way through the uh, second half last night and be clearly full value for the win, notwithstanding the, the Antonio misses, um, that's the type of thing that means everybody bounces into training and it's a reservoir that they can call on for the rest of the season, isn't it? Yeah, th success like that and results like that, I think, eventually become self-fulfilling in that the next time Manchester United fall a goal behind, uh, they will say, we've done this before, there's no reason to panic, this is not Brentford away, uh, this is not Sociedad at home in the in the Champions League, this is it, this is... Uh, you know, this is our chance to to prove things right. And the other thing that feeds into that is that when the squad is playing well, um, the competition for places just kind of looks extraordinarily better than it did last season. There was a game recently and you looked at the bench and you saw, well, Sancho was there, but he was there last season. Um, everyone on that bench that they used as game changers was already at Manchester United. They're not new this summer. And yet the squad looks better because they're in form because they want to be part of that first team and those in the first team want to stay there. So, yeah, they, they they were probably slightly fortunate, I think, last night in the way that the game went, but you cannot doubt the kind of mentality monster element of, of forcing victory late on. Probably no coincidence, Daniel, that Casemiro comes off the bench <laughs> at half-time last night and things start to take an upswing, um, even psychologically for an opposition to see the likes of Casemiro with, with such vast experience coming off the bench must have an impact. You wrote a piece for iNews uh, in the last number of days on Casemiro and, and the impact he's had at Old Trafford already. I think you said he's, he's probably had the biggest culture change at the club since since one Eric Cantona and that turned out fairly, fairly well. So what is it about Casemiro so far at Old Trafford that's just working? So, so with, with Cantona, the thing was, is it wasn't, and Ferguson said this when Cantona left and when he retired, he said it wasn't so much the impact on the pitch, although that was massive. It was that he taught Ferguson and Ferguson's fledgling players, the class of 92, the importance of, of practice, of repeated, um, you know, situation training, of fitness training, of drills, and that you could squeeze everything out of your ability. And if you look at that class of 92, that's exactly what they did. Neville, Beckham, Scholes, but. They, they were not necessarily the most talented players, but they squeezed everything out. And that, they believe, was down to Cantona. With Casemiro, I think it's this, this desperation to win. When he joined Man United, I was a bit circumspect, not because I didn't think he was very good, but because I couldn't really work out why he was there. Um, Manchester United were a mess, and it wasn't an obvious fit for him, having won the Champions League. Um, but he basically saw it as a chance to make Man United Man United again. And the, the kind of... The demonstrable hunger he has to do that is, I think, shared by nobody else currently at Manchester United other than, it seems, Eric Ten Hag. And Casemiro seems to have found a kind of kindred spirit in Ten Hag of this, like, fighting for the millimetres, he calls it. And Ten Hag has certainly found a kindred spirit in Casemiro. Uh, just to, to remind everybody that when he signed first, the first couple of games where it looked like he had been fit because he'd been playing for Real Madrid, he didn't go straight into the team. It, it, there was a couple of games where it was like Casemiro is available but not selected what's going on here and so obviously Ten Hag has just carefully 
husbanded the available resources and was was obviously I don't know what was happening there if it was just like an acclimatization uh, they were having discussions and they hadn't quite reached some kind of deep understanding because the, uh, the natural thing to do was like we're getting battered here by very mediocre teams that you're going out there and you're playing 98, 99 minutes Yeah I think so I think uh, I mean I don't know but my reading of the situation would be that Ten Hag pretty quickly realised that Casemiro is exactly what he wanted we should remember that Manchester United spent most, if not all, the summer chasing Frankie de Jong. So Casemiro was not the number one option. He was a very happy accident, in fact. And I, you know, we don't know how de Jong would have worked out, but if he'd have done better than Casemiro, then United would have certainly been in a title race. I don't think he would have done better. I think he would have taken longer to settle. So I suspect there was a bit of, yeah, an acclimatisation period where they realised it wasn't the player they were planning for. They probably wanted to keep Casemiro out of that firing line when the team was playing badly. There were enough things, I think, that Ten Hag was trying to work out without working out a new central midfielder as well. Um, and as soon as he slotted in, they looked brilliant. They've lost three league games, I think, since Casemiro started playing in the team and he only started one of those. So, yeah, the impact is 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 so obvious. It's actually a little bit forgotten about now in the narrative. The whole uh, transfer saga was not about this guy. This was like a completely left field. So maybe the whole better to have a, a lucky general than a good one. If Ten Hag is going to be lucky for a couple of seasons, then that's great too. Yeah, I mean, it's about, he would say, and you know, he's probably at the benefit of the doubt at the moment, that it's about, you know, football management is, is partly about proactive work and planning for opposition and planning for problems. And partly about reactive work, which is when something changes, it's how quickly you react to that because, you know, he will know as well as anyone that two or three bad results at a club like Manchester United in a row and the pressure is on and the pressure was on at the start of the season. You know, we had the whole kind of Eric 10 months thing when he was joined and people were quickly changing that to Eric 10 games after the Brentford defeat. Um, But his ability to react in that situation and yes, obviously have a player like Casemiro to come into the team, but it goes beyond that. You know, it's the way he's guided certain players. It's the, the culture he's instilled in the dressing room, the kind of this idea of discipline, you know, the dropping Marcus Rashford two hours before a match because he was 10 minutes late to the pregame meeting. These sort of things make a difference and they sound a bit twee in hindsight, but they really do make a difference. You know, you're dealing with human beings here and they are all very good players, but he is, he is motivating them in a way that the last two, three, four managers haven't. Maybe I'm not following the right accounts anymore, but I do remember there was like pictures coming from training of who had won the five-a-side when Solskjaer was there. I haven't seen those. Uh, I haven't heard any uh, gossip about people being cliquey. I haven't heard any of the the leaks that were coming from the the team over the last four or five seasons. Now, loads of players who have media empires are no longer part of it. But there are those players who were there who are potentially disaffected, who for whatever reason aren't having their agent stories appear in the newspapers. Yeah. And and you know, to to move on from the very obvious thing I just said, like footballers are human beings and they don't if you're a professional footballer, you want your team to win. You want to be playing and you want your team to win. And for that to happen, you want a culture at your club that makes you feel valued. At work, in our place of work, we all want to feel valued. We all want to feel like we can make a difference. We want to feel like the people directly above us care about us. And we want to feel like the people around us, our peers and and ourselves, are all working towards the same goal. It sounds very simple, but I think at a football club with this kind of mass of politics, particularly, as you say, with some of the, 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 the egos they had at the club, that became very difficult. And although it might seem like Ken Hag is a very complex manager tactically, he's relying on very simple principles of, I'm new here, I want it to work. Some of you are new here, the same. Some of you aren't. So tell me what wasn't working before and let's work on a plan that does work. And that that's, <laughs> ostensibly, that's what he's done. It comes down to attitude as well, Daniel, doesn't it, for, amongst the players. Like I think of the likes of Garnacho who had... Uh, supposedly some attitude problems in training which have clearly disappeared Fred comes on and does a job you have Varane going over and, and kind of uh, fist pumping the, the supporters at the end of every win and Casemiro I mean you, you touched on it in your piece as well like he, he scores a goal in Wembley and, and there's barely a, a, a glimmer of a smile on his face <laughs> even after the full time whistle he's given out to Bruno Fernandes for not squaring the ball to Sancho and the biggest cheer of the afternoon from him came when he shepherds the ball out for a goal kick I mean a born winner comes to mind as the phrase yeah, it does. And that, and that sort of thing rubs off on players around you. There's no doubt about that. 
you know, again, to mention Cantona, I remember Roy Keane kind of saying, you know, he walks in the place with his collar turned up and he's like, you know, I own this place. Show me that you do too. Show me that you'll join me. And Casemiro, I don't think, is the per- the type of personality off the pitch to demand that kind of, you know, he's not a, a, a huge personality, but what he does is set an example like nobody else. And he also has the ultimate answer if anyone questions him because if, if any player says well you know is this the right way he can say well I, I, I've won five Champions League titles mate and that's more than the rest of this squad other than Rafael Varane have together so maybe I am right maybe my example is right you mentioned Varane in terms of fist bumping as well this stuff works getting the fans on side works getting the players around you works and yeah, it, it, it sounds simple and it, it looks more simple because Manchester United have a collection of very talented players and now a talented coach. But the same principles are true, whether it's National League or Premier League or Champions League. If you buy, if you get buy-in from supporters, buy-in from senior players and bring the younger players with you, it can look very exciting very quickly. Nice handy follow-up fixture at Anfield on, on Sunday, of course. Um, is there a possibility that they can crowbar their way into the title race? Yeah, I'm going. I can't wait because... Well, I, I got tricked into thinking that Liverpool might be back and then I went to the Real Madrid home game uh, and got very quickly tricked back out of that. Um, Liverpool have since kept clean sheets, but it does feel now that when a, a, a high-class, in-form opponent comes along, they have weaknesses that are very easy to spot. And that is Ten Hag's mantra, basically, spotting opposition weaknesses and, and playing on them. Um, I think they will probably win and I think they'll probably delight in winning. And... I don't think they are in a title race at the moment, but maybe that's a maybe that's the perfect scenario because they're certainly in the other three competitions that they're, they're fighting for. And if you end up kind of sleepwalking into a title race by just knocking through wins and other people slipping up, all the better. That is the best way to enter a title race if you've not been fancied. Reduce the pressure by just kind of sitting under the surface and letting the two teams above you do what they do and then kind of coming through. I think they're probably too late because of that early start of the season, but that doesn't mean we should give anything other than a kind of positive inflection to this. What's your feeling about where City are at at the moment? Because like, so we, we see a very, very competent, ruthless performance from Arsenal last night. We can talk about them in a minute, but um, if if Manchester United are to get back in the title race, they obviously do need to make up the six-point odds on, on City. Uh, is that is that like our city about to reel off fifteen games and we'll all go ah oh, there they are? It yeah. doesn't feel that way for whatever no, reason. No, I've been saying that for about three months and it feels like we're running out of fifteen game streaks now. So yeah, they 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 are. I, I can't really work them out. My 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 kind of hypothesis is that the top three from last season in what was an exhaustive season, going into an exhaustive this season, this season with obviously the World Cup in the middle were, were Liverpool, Chelsea and Manchester City. And two of those clubs have fallen off really badly and one of them has fallen off slightly. And I think the reason that City have only fallen off slightly is because um, A, the manager and B, the form they had from last season uh, and the squad they have has kind of taken them through those pronounced dips. But it isn't the same City. Um, they're trying to do different things in midfield. They're trying to do different things with the fullbacks. You know, Cancelo's left, Rico Lewis has come in. They're trying to acclimatise Erling Haaland and change the way they attack. So they aren't the same city. If Arsenal are not going to get a better chance to win the league, I don't think this season is probably the best way to put it because next year, I'm sure they will be back to their imperious best. And um, they aren't quite there at the moment. They aren't going to do the 12 wins in a row. I don't believe that anymore because they've just dropped too many silly points. You know, Brentford at home, Forest away, it's yeah, it's just very uncity like. So it is Arsenal's to lose, I think, without creating that undue pressure on them that they haven't bottled a title race if they don't win it. Is there the argument we were kind of talking about it this morning, Daniel, that Arsenal just don't have that title winning experience in the squad? Because everyone's everyone's been saying that the blip is is just around the corner for Arsenal, but but so far they've been they've been brilliant. I think there comes a point where title winning experience will be key and we we are probably about to find out how much the difference off the pitch signing Gabriel Jesus and uh, Alexander Zinchenko will make as title winners. Um, but Arsenal are almost flipping that narrative on it, their head at the moment. They're kind of, because they've got the, the youngest team in the Premier League and they've got one of the most experienced, inexperienced managers in terms of title races in that I can remember in Premier League history. Um, they're almost doing this on the fly, but managing to convert that into a positive. It's not that they lack the experience, it's that they lack the, the kind of inbuilt pressure or the fear um, that comes with 
being in title races and not having won them before. So they're fresh, they're new. They were fourth or fifth favourites at the start of the season. They seem to be still running on that kind of autumn vibe of just our attacking players are better than your defensive players. So at the end of this game, we're probably going to have won. And somehow they're managing to absolve themselves of that pressure. It will come, um, not least in that City away game. That is obviously huge if City are within grabbing distance. But there's something very early Klopp Liverpool about this Arsenal team in that they're able to kind of swat opponents away and only realise the importance of what they've done after they've done it. Do you feel Liverpool are... Since that Real Madrid game you said you intended, like, do you feel like they're they're turning somewhat of a corner or are they going to be back, brought, brought back down to earth this weekend? Because we're seeing performances from the likes of Simicast and Jada. Salah has a smile on his face uh, as well. The, the last three or four games have been a little, aside from the Real Madrid game, have been more encouraging for Jurgen Klopp? Yeah, I, I think it's probably now as simple as they are in a, a, a mind frame and in a place with the midfield where they will be beaten by the highest class opponents, but they still have enough drive under Klopp because he he clearly still has the love from the squad and they still have enough talent, particularly in sacking areas and in central defence, if they can get a partnership that stays together where um, they will beat, or they should beat most teams in the Premier League. I, I'm not sure if that most teams includes Manchester United at home. That's what makes it a fascinating game for me. But yeah, they have enough to beat teams like Wolves at home. They had enough to beat Newcastle, um, because they had 20 minutes where everyone performed their peak and their opponent completely fell apart. They will still be able to do that, Liverpool. They're good enough. I just don't think they're good enough to, um, famous last words, I don't think they're quite going to have enough to push for that top four. Uh, from a tactical perspective, how does Ten Hag attack? What what? So the weakness in, in midfield that we, we all believe Liverpool have at the moment, how do you get at that with his current crop of players, Ten Hag's current crop of players, I mean? So what I think Ten Hag will do and what he does a lot is he talks about counter-pressing, which is basically when you lose the ball high at the pitch, try to win it back within a period of time with these kind of triggers. And there's triggers. So when one player gets the ball, everyone will know. Let's say Virgil van Dijk gets the ball at feet. Everyone will know where they're running. When Alisson gets the ball to feet, everyone will know where they're running. If you look at that Real Madrid game, I mean, there was a very obvious error from, from Alisson, which came from being pressed. Um, but in general... Um, again against Crystal Palace last week you saw Liverpool players just look defenders looking incredibly worried under pressure not really knowing where their next pass was not knowing um, who was going to be available and, and the Liverpool we knew as a very successful outfit knew their next action they knew where the next pass was going to come from and that, that stems from confidence from players let's say Fabinho not being quite at it and so maybe not demanding the ball in those tight areas because he's afraid of losing it so that will be what Ten Hag says. He will say, press up the pitch, force errors, because as soon as you force an error for a goal against a, a team at home in a big game, you kind of put the fear of God into everyone. You, you scare the crowd, you scare the player who's made the pass and the next player that's receiving the pass. So I think it will all be about that pressure off the ball. And to make a very obvious point, that's why not having Cristiano Ronaldo in this team um, works better because it's a real team ethic in that attack in terms of the pressing. Can I just ask you briefly, Daniel, about the, the relegation battle in the Premier League? So we're currently looking Southampton in 18 points, rock bottom, Bournemouth 21 points and Everton 21 points with Leeds just outside the relegation spots on 22. Uh, bad result for Sean Dyche and Everton last night. I know Nottingham Forest are a team you follow closely as well. They're up to 13th. They have a lot of teams in the rearview mirror, but still they're only, what, four points above relegation? And you look at that game this weekend, Sunday, two o'clock, Forest at home to Sean Dyches Everton. I mean, there are some big, big games coming up. How, how do you see the relegation <laughs> battle playing out? Yeah, as a Forest fan, I've kind of labelled... We've been dreadful away from home. We scored three away goals in Premier League this season. The record is lowest seven by Norwich, and we're hardly closing down on that at the moment. So the, the, home, games, <clears throat> the home games are massive anyway. And you look at Forest's record at home, and it's brilliant. They haven't lost since... October in the league at home. They've beaten Leeds, they've beaten Palace, um, they beat West Ham back in August. So, yeah, this is vital. If Forest win this, they're seven points above Everton with a game in hand. Uh, and the reality is, is those teams aren't really picking up enough points elsewhere. Um, but if Forest lose that and suddenly they become unstuck at home, then they're in, then I think they go down because they're just not doing anything away from home. Everyone above Everton is looking at Everton, Bournemouth and Southampton and saying, please let you be our three 
please let you not pick up enough points because for whatever for various reasons there's an awful lot of teams and it goes above forest to you know even to palace that are creaking and are just kind of desperate for the season to be over and we're in early march but we've still got 15 14 games left of the season um because of the world cup so there's 35 40 percent of the season to play now and yet we're looking at it as a kind of the longest home straight in premier league history it's going to be very interesting to see who ties up daniel great to have you with us thanks a million for joining us cheers cheers thank you very much enjoy the game on sunday as well it's daniel story there chief football writer with i newspaper 